to a year ago, but I'm sure everybody remembers a year ago at this time was a bit chaotic. Um, so that's going to be, after agenda review, we're going to jump right into that. It's going to be um, probably an hour, hour and a half discussion um, with, you know, half hour, 45 minutes of Mr. Christina um, giving us some tips on how to be an effective board and leaving a half hour, 45 minutes for us to ask some questions. Um, we do have some agenda items after that. I don't think any of them are anything too in depth. Um, and really, they were just things that we need to take care of before the summer. Again, the intention of the meeting was for the training. So um, we will do a gender review. I think Patty had a couple of additions. Thank you. I do. Um, we need to have a consent added after non public. And non public becomes small letters B and C. We have two informational items. I'm counting yours, April, as one. And then we also need to have a non meeting at the end to discuss some negotiations. And that's all I have. Great. Um, and so that included the one that April had mentioned. Is there any other additions or changes on the agenda? Okay. Um, then with that, I will introduce, do we have a mic that we can just give? Do you want to sit right over here, Barrett? You, yeah, that's absolutely fine. Um, so tonight we have with us Barrett Christina, who is, um, what's what's your, president? Yeah. Executive Director of the New Hampshire School Board Association. And so um, I will turn it over to him to talk less tonight.
<laughs> if it's easier for you to speak without the mask, feel free. Yeah, I mean, you're pretty distant, so sometimes talking into the microphone is easier without a mask. <laughs> right. Is your mic on, Barrett? I'm not sure. Yeah, just for the folks at home. That better, I hope. How's that? Good? Right? All right. Very good. I apologize. Um, so uh, we talked about um, uh, employment related policies and then um, budget related policies. Keep a thumb or actually I'll, I'll, I'll get to that later and I won't read through the rest of those, but um, the big one um, the last bullet point there. Department of Education rule 306. That's what's known as the minimum standards for public school approval. And the minimum standards in and of themselves are probably if you were to print them off probably 80 or 100 pages long. And they list every single thing that a school has to offer in New Hampshire to be an approved school by the Department of Education. Everything from curricular offerings, from um, uh, graduation requirements, from counseling services, from school health, uh, length of the school day and hours and minutes and things of that nature. But um, those are more the delivery of educational services found within the, edu within the minimum standards. But again, there are key responsibilities of school boards within the minimum standards and 306.04a is a, where it talks about the school board shall it's all policy related. I think 26 or so policies that are required by law just within the minimum standards. So again, we've got the rules of the, or the, the, the responsibilities of the school board under ED 303, mostly policy making responsibilities. We've got the minimum standards policy responsibilities and it's not just the department of education rules i i presume um you know people around the table watch the news or read the newspaper um and so we've listed the there are also state statutes rsas that require numerous policies and the, the, on the top of page three are just some examples that are you, you probably did the, the i put these in here as, as the examples because these have been um, either in the news or have been amended recently by the legislature. So they've probably been on your on your policy plate at some point in the last maybe, you know, as early as last year and as far back as maybe four or five years ago. Bullying, concussions for youth sports, use of restraints, truancy and attendance and absenteeism, criminal background checks, uh, school lunch payments, health and sex education, non-academic surveys, so on and so forth. So, you know, the, that's one manner in which the legislature sort of exercises its oversight over over local school boards, where you know they say there ought to be, you know, school board has to adopt a policy, school board has to adopt a policy. Um, the good thing about all these policy requirements, with a couple exceptions, um, this is where you are able to exercise local control with how you want your policies to look in temporal. Now, you, you're probably aware that NHSBA provides sample policies, template policies to, to our members. Um, but those are just sort of boilerplate language because, you know, we've got 160 school districts and presumably the policies in Pembroke are going to look different than they are in, in Manchester or Nashua or, or Colebrook, for example. Um, so, in, in a, one example is, uh, I just use this as, as the homework policy. There's, a, there's a, a requirement in the minimum standards that school boards have a policy on homework. Every school board does it differently. Some school districts, homework counts as credit. Other districts, it doesn't. Some districts, there are uh, re recommended guidance. Is it 10 minutes per class or something like that? Whatever sort of a general rule of thumb is. Other boards don't have that. So the, the, the rule or the statute doesn't say what has to be in your homework policy, but you get to exercise how you want that to look like. Um, there are a couple exam a couple um, uh, uh, exceptions to that, the bullying policy, your bullying policy is like 10 pages long, the statute, the out 10 paragraphs of what has to be within your bullying policy. The, um, I think the, the restraint seclusion policy is also very prescriptive as well too. Primary role and responsibility right off the bat, policy making.
So every board generally does it a little bit differently. What we would, so in some districts, um, it will be um, perhaps an administrator that gives it a first glance and then makes recommendation for the school board. My experience tells me that most boards, not all, but most or many anyway, do have a policy committee. Um, and that could be sometimes it's one person <laughs> who just takes it on. They like the policy work. Um, other times it may be um, two school board members, just so you get a little back and forth and you know you can exchange ideas. Um, some boards will have, depending on the size of the district, will have an administrator um, uh, as part of that policy committee. And then um, other boards, I think most boards probably do this. Um, they will bring in other school district staff on what I'll just call on an as needed basis. So if you're dealing with health related policies, you might bring in the school nurse for that conversation. If you're dealing with technology related policies, you might bring in your IT. And then that committee makes a recommendation. It goes to the full board. This is what the committee recommends. Um, there's no requirement in law that you do a first or second reading of the policy. That's sort of more a um, practice so that if a committee is bringing forth a recommendation, everybody can hear it once, parents in the audience can hear it once, the board can digest it a little bit, you may have questions, you may either want to consult with local council or consult with NHSBA, um, and then you may need to bring back the school nurse or the IT director, the committee may make some revisions and then bring it back to the board for a second reading. Another one yet? Definitely. Email our staff attorney, Will Phillips, and say, Will, um, the, the board or the committee made some revisions to this. We're looking at bringing it to the board at our meeting on July 15th. Can you take a look at it? And all you got to do is email. Um, you know, a notice is obviously helpful. If it's, the, if it's the day before the meeting, you may not get to it. But yeah, Will does that all the time. Yep. Any other questions? Still on page three, uh, continuing on, um, uh, I should change this word. I, I think about this all the time. We, we put in here, establish the school district budget and provide budget oversight. Well, it's not really the school board that establishes the budget, it's the, it's the voters. Um, but still, the board obviously puts together um, its own proposed budget. Uh, do you have a municipal budget committee here in Pembroke? So it's their budget that goes to the voters. Um, but there is still within RSA 32, um, even if you have a... Uh, um, a municipal budget committee that presents the budget to the voters. The board is still supposed to put together its own recommended budget, and I, I presume to do that. Um, this is where we get into sort of the oversight aspect and 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 some some other aspects of of good governance. So it's not like you just you know it's not like the budget committee puts together the budget and the voters gather in the second Tuesday in March and you adopt it and you're done with your budget. I imagine you're dealing with you know budget issues at every single meeting, right? There's manifest reviews request for expenditures. Um, from time to time, you may have to do line item transfers, um, you know, where you put, you know, you budgeted for 10 snowstorms to, to plow the driveway, but this winter we got 20, so that line item has to go up. You may have to find money from somewhere else. Um, uh, what else? Lim limitations on expenditures, um, you know, you, you if sort of the no means no, um, what you can spend money on and what you can't necessarily spend money on. Uh, treasurer's uh, duties, um, uh, board authorized to make payments. That's that's sort of the manifest review, if you will. Um, and you know some other Department of Education rules as well too. Um, so, uh, but when the when the when the budcom is is in charge of the budget, that um, <laughs> changes things up a, a little bit. Some of your responsibilities are are less, I guess I would say. Um, but you know you still got the oversight aspect and. Um, you know, another way you can exercise, you know, proper oversight is, uh, do you get monthly reports or quarterly reports, things of that nature, everybody's kind of nodding. Around. So, and then you look through them, some boards, you know, are, are we'll give that good, very deep scrutiny. Other boards, depending on the relationship with the superintendent or the business manager, trust that it's being done appropriately, 
your yearly audits have come back fine every year, so you know that the central office changed. But policy, budget responsibilities. Um, C, um, hire a superintendent. Um, you've been here a little while now, Patty, haven't you? Haven't you? I was going to say, I like to, to joke, this is, the, this is the one thing that boards should do as least less frequently as, as, as possible. Um, it just the, the consistency can help can help a district. It, it really can. Um, but more importantly, and, and coextensive, um, open to page four with the um, hire the superintendent is um, is you have to evaluate the superintendent on an annual basis. And does are you doing that? Do you have a process or a system? No. Um, let me let me give you some ideas then. And if we want to talk about this, Andy or Patty, if you want to um, give me or Will a call to talk about this a little bit more in depth at some point. Um, first of all, from a, a, just a simple legal requirement, you are legally obligated to to conduct an evaluation of the superintendent on an annual basis. There's a Department of Education rule um, that that we have listed there, 303.01K, that you have to that you have to do that every year. Um, I haven't seen, um, uh, there's a legal obligation, I haven't seen your contract, Patty, but I've seen a lot of superintendent contracts and every one of them has a provision that they'll evaluate the superintendent. Um, and the last legal requirement, back to the beginning, you probably have a policy that speaks to uh, the board conducting an evaluation of, of superintendent. Um, the, the second reason, obviously, I mean, aside from the legal obligations, um, you know, one, I think every employee deserves to be evaluated. They should know what their employer is thinking about. Two, uh, or I guess, three, now, another point related to that, it's a type of thing where if you haven't done an evaluation in, say, a couple years, two or three years, it's never a problem until it becomes a problem. Um, <laughs> and and I've, I've seen that. They haven't evaluated the superintendent, and they don't want to renew his contract for whatever reason, or they want to get rid of him in the middle, him or her in the middle of the, contract you haven't evaluated in three years what are you saying my my, my form of this substance same thing with the teacher if you don't evaluate the teacher you can't non-renew them right um a couple of just sort of broad general recommendations about um uh, uh the evaluation process um first the, the the process or method or the rubric or the tool or, or evaluation form that has to be a joint conversation with the school board and the student well, it's the board's ultimate responsibility. You have to bring the employee in, or the superintendent especially, to make sure that the evaluation form lines up with what directives you're giving the superintendent. And make, make sure it lines up with what Patty's responsibilities are. Um, and it makes it lines up with the goal setting um, you know, that you've established for Patty, for the board, for the district. That's point one. You, so you, you have to have that on the front end. Does this work? Does this not work? Um, we have some on file, but I will also tell you that from my experience, the best evaluation, I'm just going to call it process generally, are developed locally. I, I, I can find rubrics and evaluation forms online. Some of them are okay. I've yet to find one that I think is good. I've been looking for one for 15 years. Find one, let me know. Um, but, um, and, and why are they developed locally? Well, because, you know, the board has an expectation of how it wants Pembroke or SAU 53 to be operated. That may be different 10 or 15 miles down the road, right? Um, uh, continuing on, um, the first part of, of the evaluation is not the evaluation, it's the goal setting. I don't know if you, do you, does the board do retreats in the summer now and then? Some boards do that. And you said, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, we can, yeah, we can, we can, we can talk about that as well too. Um, so, so a lot, often many boards will have, um, they'll have a retreat. Um, this time of year, you know, after graduation, sometime in the middle of, of, of July, um, some boards do it off site. It's still a public meeting, presumably. Um, if you're talking about sort of district goal setting and board goal setting, that would be a public meeting. Superintendent goal setting, you might be able to get by um, under paragraph C um, um, of the right to know law. 
Um, but you, you do the goal setting from the first instance. Why? Because that's what the evaluation is going to be based on. If there aren't goals, what exactly or what specifically are you going to evaluate? That's how, that's tough to ascertain. Um, make the goals manageable and reachable um, to the extent that you can benchmark some of those. So, okay, you say, Patty, over the next school year, we want these, we want to see growth or whatever word you want to phrase. We want to see these three to five things get done or, or, or at least for the process of moving the district this direction. Patty's going to say, okay, but let's be mindful of time, cost, manpower, resources, things of that nature. Um, and then I'm also a firm believer um, that you don't do one summative evaluation at the end of the school year. Um, check the contract, check Patty's contract too, and, and, and not picking on Patty, but she's the superintendent here, so I'm going to use her name. Um, there may be notice provisions in, in Patty's contract as to when the evaluation is to be completed by April 1st, May 1st, June 1st, things of that nature. Um, but um, that's all why I, I favor doing sort of the quote what I'll call mini evaluations during the course of the school year and why you want to benchmark some of these things. You set the goals sort of at the end of the school year um, or around this time of year. You check in with Patty in the middle of middle of October. You do sort of a mini evaluation. Where are these? I know it was summer, but we sort of benchmarking. Are we making progress or are we moving forward? What supports do you need from the school board so you can be successful? And then you loop back around, you do another quote unquote mini evaluation and maybe a January, February time frame. Same sort of thing. Where are we? We're benchmarking. What supports do you need? How's this moving? Do we need to pivot? Do we need to turn? You know, what's going on? Did COVID hit and, and all the things that we planned, planned last July are no longer relevant or doable? Um, and then closer to the end of the year in like a May, June time frame, you do the more summit. Um, but if you just wait till sort of the end of the school year, um, it, I mean, the reality is the superintendent's being evaluated every day and every every single school year. Get that. Um, but it, just those check-ins to make sure you're reaching your benchmarks and you're on track to meet your goals. That's why you want to do those, those sort of check-ins throughout the course of the year. The other reason that helps, um, and we get this call often this time of year, um, depending on the turnover on your you get two or three new school board members in March and you're doing your full summative evaluation in June, those, those people have only worked with Patty for, you know, maybe a half a dozen school board. So it's not fair to Patty and it's not necessarily fair to them to be have to sort of evaluate this employee that they really don't have a working relationship with yet. But if you sort of benchmark those moving along and then they come on, Andy? No, 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 no. Right. Yeah. It's. Yeah. That, yeah, that, that, that's a good question. Um, and sometimes I, for, I forget about that if I'm if I'm in a multi district SAU. Yeah, I think ultimately um, uh, it's the SAU's responsibility as the hiring authority to do the evaluation. Um, that does not mean that the individual boards cannot do their own evaluations because the goal setting and, and expectations in Pembroke may be different than they are in, you do Deerfield too, right, mm -hmm. Patty? Mm -hmm. Might be different than they are in Deerfield. Um, and, you know, that can, one of, I guess, the benefits, I think, of, of an SAU like SAU 53, um, and again, please correct me if I'm wrong, I know Deerfield sends most of their kids to Concord mm -hmm. High, right? But the other districts send them here. Mm -hmm. So there's some continuity, at least, among the boards and the students and whatnot. Um, and one way to do this, I'm not, I don't have a recommendation on this um, one way or the other, but um, I do know that SAU 16, which is Exeter and the surrounding towns, somewhat similar where they've got the, the high school and all the little towns, they all send their kids to the same middle school and high school. Um, they do the evaluation um, by executive committee, if you will. I think it's the chairs of, of the multiple school districts. And the individual board members are submit comments, fill out a form or, you know, whatever process that they use there, um, uh, uh, you know, a rubric, a form or whatever. And then I believe the board chair 
aggregates that for this district and then multiple board chairs get together and have a conversation to make sure that that I guess it's consistent more than anything. Um, you know, one of the challenges too with like a traditional sort of scoring rubric, if I give Patty a one, you give Patty a five, does that mean she's a three? Like <laughs> there's a disconnect there, right? But what out what that can also help with though, let's say a five member school board, if two board members give Patty a one and two board members give Patty a five, that you have to have a conversation about that, right? Because obviously somebody, something's getting lost, something is getting lost in the middle. Um, but anyway, that's one way to do it as well, too, because I mean, there's got to be, what, 20 school board members between the four or five districts here, right? 23. 23, right. I mean, 23 of you sitting in a room having a conversation with Patty trying to evaluate her would be, I mean, that'd be a circus, you know? Yep. That's that's why that's why you need to get together and figure out a process that's going to work. Evaluation, tool, process, rubric, um, and reach out to your colleagues, Patty. I was going to ask a question if I could. Um, Peter and I have talked about this because we we talk, started talking about it last year, and we gathered up the tools. And you you had mentioned that you weren't crazy about any one of them. And Peter and I talked about the fact that obviously Alan Sunshine, Chester, and Epsom are going to be much more depth at evaluating him and Hemmer right. and Deerfield with me. And we were thinking that if it would meet the criteria, if we had, if I did goal setting with Pembroke, we talked about my goals, you know, they wrote something up and then we submit it to the executive board and they kind of accept the recommendations of Deerfield and Pembroke. For my evaluation, does that meet? I, th I think, I, I mean, the, the, the rule, this is on the top of page four. This is, this is all the rule says. School boards, it's that first bullet point. School boards shall annually evaluate the superintendent based on written criteria established by the school board slash FAU board. Um, so based on, on the written criteria, I think on one part that it's relating to the criteria of the evaluation, but I don't see any um, prohibition in law to the SAU board creating their own process for how they want it. Yeah, I mean, I, I forgot that, you know, and maybe it's only Deerfield and Pembroke that 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 conduct your evaluation, um, and and then you know Peter's Peter's evaluated by by the other three districts. So, um, let's um if you want to continue that conversation more, you know we're happy to come down and have a seriously we could do we could talk about this for probably two hours or so. Um, but and and just not that this is any you know doesn't help you at all, but every board struggles with this and every. And and unless you're, um, no, I shouldn't say every board, you know, but being in a, a multi-district SAU is just another wrinkle that makes things a little bit more challenging too. But lots of boards have lots of boards struggle struggle with this aspect. And I've 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 reached out to the colleagues nationwide about guidance. They have a PowerPoint on some sort of process, and it's just it's like I said, some of them are okay. Not, none of them I. Which is why I get down to like you got to find a process that works for you here in SAU fifty three. Any other questions on that? Great. Um, I'm going to continue on. Then I'm on page four. Conduct hearings and serve as an adjudicative body. Uh, let me ask you before I spend too too much time on this. Have Have you had to have any hearings here? Suspensions, disciplines, non renewals. Okay, everybody's nodding. Let me Let me talk about this a little bit because in 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 my opinion, this is where the rubber really meets the road with um, good governance and good school board roles and responsibilities and following policy and following protocol and following best practices. So we know that um, there are, you, 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 we know that there are various, I mean, from every source of law, the constitution under basic due process standards, various state statutes, department of education rules and perhaps your local policies 
um, give legal, give rights to a uh, hearing before the school board. I mean, you've got some examples, the bullet points there, manifest educational hardship, suspensions and expulsions, uh, transportation, bus removal, if the, if the kid is being naughty on the bus, bullying, there's a, a provision in the law, uh, residency, um, we don't see many of those too much anymore, but where a parent claims that they're living where they're not actually living to attend for the purpose of attending school. Uh, early admission to first grade, um, we get that pop up from time to time. The kid is apparently a genius, and if he's not in first grade, by the time he's four, he's not going to Harvard, and his whole life is going to be ruined. So, um, and then on the employee side, a, a dismissal or an employee is being removed in the middle of the school year, in the in, in the middle of, the, of your, your terminating the contract right then. And a non-renewal hearing where a tenured teacher um, uh, uh, has received some poor evaluations over the course of a couple years, where the superintendent is recommending that that teacher not be offered a, a contract for the following year. And then labor grievances under your collective bargaining. They pop up from time to time too, and there's usually a step along the grievance process where the local school board has a, has a hearing to determine if the, if the, if the teacher's right or if it support the administration or whatever it should be. Um, so a couple points on on, on the your hearings aspect. Uh, first, um, the, 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 the primary aspect that I want to drive home is you have to come into those hearings as a board as clean as possible, without as much background information. You know, whatever information you think you need to make a determination. You will get at the hearing, sort of like on a need. I call it. It's like the like on a need to know basis, right? Is that like the military saying or whatnot? So if you've got an allegation of, of whatever it may be, bullying, Johnny selling dope in the bathroom, whatever it may be. First of all, stay off of Facebook or social media because you're going to get 18 sides of the story, um, and none of them are going to be accurate. Um, don't investigate yourself so we talked a little bit about collective authority versus individual authority um you know you don't have a specific right or obligation or responsibility to call the teacher or to call the parents um you know you, you can't investigate these sorts of things yourself um you're going to hear things and that's fine just because you know you, you just it's a small town i assume that you all you know all the teachers you know all the kids, your kids play a little league together, and people are going to talk about it, or they come up to you at Hannaford and say, oh, what did you hear about this? Did you hear about that? What are you doing with this? Um, so you really have to try and stay as clean as possible. Superintendent can give you a report, just giving everybody a heads up. A student was arrested you know, at, at the school today. The allegations is he was selling marijuana in the bathroom. That's all you need to know. You don't need to know. Where he got the marijuana, you don't need to know how much he was charging for the rent marijuana. You don't need to know how many how many kids he he sold it to. You don't need to know any of that stuff. There'll be an investigation, whether it's police, internal, outside counsel, whatever it may be. And if it gets to a hearing, you will you will get the information that you need at that. Um, and 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 that's just a, 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 I want to hammer that home only because. I think that gets to the real roles and responsibilities. It's not the board's job to investigate these sorts of things. Done by other people. Um, and, and be mindful of, of how much information you're going to get from the outside before you step into that, into that um, to the hearing and, and make a decision about some kids' rights or some, some staff members' rights. It's rare, but I'm aware of a, a, a couple situations in the state, none too recently, but um, one within the last probably six or seven years, maybe seven or eight years, and one maybe about 10 or 12 years ago, where the, the, the board, or at least a quorum of the school board, had spoiled itself by asking around, talking to the victims, talking to the witnesses ahead of the hearing, um, where they could, they could not be fair and impartial. So they, those people sort of excluded themselves from the, from the hearing. And the lawyer had to run around, the lawyer representing the district had to run around town trying to find five, seven people to serve as sort of stand-in board members for the purpose of this hearing. And yeah, 
and they they you know they found some they found some like former school board members you know and so at least people that at least had some knowledge of the process and whatnot but what a pain i mean what a what a what a real pain so um anyway and 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 just to you know not to put every anybody on edge like i said just because you know the parents or know the kid or know the teacher that doesn't exclude you from being able to come in and 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 providing a, a full and fair hearing. It's the knowledge and the information about the the incident that you that can that can lead to further problems. Questions about that? How am I doing on time? Sorry. Um, gonna I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna hit. The, the next three or four I can get through quickly, but I want to spend some time talking about the superintendent's responsibilities and how these overlap. Um, I'm on page five, collective bargaining. What do you got at least two, two new uh, bargaining units here in Pembroke, your teachers and your parents? Okay. Um, G, communicate with the public. I want to hit home on this um, a, a, little, a little bit more in depth. Um, when we talk about communication with the public, I don't just mean you know the notice requirements and minute requirements under the right to know rule. I'm talking about letting your community know what's going on. Um, and when we used to do our new school board member orientation that we've been doing remotely the last couple of years, we used to do that in person. And we'd get 100 new school board members in a conference room at our office in Concord. And I'd look out, and I mean, I could tell, why, why do you run for the school? And I would just pick random people. Can you tell me why you ran for the school? Obviously, the most common answer was, well, I got kids in the school. Makes sense, right? The second most common answer was, I wanted better communication from my school board. I didn't feel like they were telling the, the, their constituents in the community enough about what was going on. And so while we certainly found that out the last year and a half, haven't we, that, that especially our parents, right, communication is key, especially when dealing with, I mean, obviously part of that situation specific and goal specific. Um, but what else did we also see, though? I know I see we're still zooming, zooming the meetings. You got a lot more people on the Zoom than you ever did coming in person, right? I think that's a wonderful thing. Um, but the other aspect to that is it's easier to communicate with people now than it ever has been. How many of you have a, have a smartphone on you right now? How many of you use that smartphone to either wake you up or you looked at it within five seconds of waking? Everybody, right? Every hand in the room goes up. That's how our parents and our kids are, are getting the information these days, right? You don't send letters home in the mail anymore, do you? You send it via email. You put it on a Facebook, if you got a Facebook page or social media or, or whatever, or, or some districts tweet, you know, congrats to the basketball team, congrats to the seniors on this great day, you know, whatever it may be. Um, so, and, and, you know, so much of this obviously is going to be topic specific, but, you know, if, if you're looking at bonding something because you need a new roof or a new boiler, Start telling people now, <laughs> you know, if, if, if you know that's in the pipeline coming up in March, start talking about that now. If you know that there's going to be a renovation or an issue or, or, or not, a, not an issue, but a, a project or something, going on, start communicating with them now so they so nobody's caught by surprise. Um, yeah, question? <clears throat> I mean, yeah, I mean, part of it, you have to, and, you know, part of it is a, is a resource issue and a man hour, you know, issue. You know, Patty can't be sitting on Facebook all day long. Her admin assistant can't be sitting on Facebook all day long. Um, some boards, um, uh, uh, you know, will have a, 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 either a designated employee or perhaps a designated board member. It's usually an employee. Um, have a policy um, on, on, on school board use of social media. We have a sample policy that lays out some protocols just for like things like password protection, like like if it's going to be an employee, who's going to have access to it? You know what I mean? And then, you know, I don't think you need a, a, a policy about what is going to be posted, but, you know, you could have a conversation about, you know, about stuff. Oh, you know, hey, 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 Patty, I saw that the, you know, the basketball team won the game and somebody sent something out or, or I see that there's, the, you know, a fifth grade art contest in the gymnasium next week. Can we, can we advertise that out a little bit? Oftentimes, what do we do? We advertise the parents, right? 
right? You know, and that makes sense, all right? But, you know, who gets notice of, of the fifth grade art, you know, art project thing that's going to be in the gymnasium on Tuesday night? The parents are going to get there. Are you going to get a lot of community members to show up? Probably not, but it's good publicity, right? You know, it, it highlights the highlights the good things that are going on well, too. So, you know, there's the spreading the good news. There's the information, you know, snow day, how water main broke, schools closed, you know, whatever it may be. There's the good news that we could all use a little bit of that. Um, and I like kids. I like the good things that are going on here. What parent doesn't want to see their kid on a Facebook page holding up a trophy or scoring the touchdown or, or winning some sort of award? So, um, um, yeah, I, I, I probably have. Um, if I were to think about my file, if you send me or our staff attorney um, a reminder email, I probably have some articles. Just Google, just school board use of social, you know, how school boards can effectively use social media. So, slide plenty of How many constituents do you have? Parents, kids, staff, taxpayers, retired people, the budget committee, everybody. Every, I mean, everybody pays taxes. They're all your constituents. Reach out to all. Yep, absolutely. Um, and strategic planning. Um, I'm moving on, trying to be trying to be quick with this. Strategic planning. Um, there's actually a, a, a. It's not called strategic planning in the rule, but there's a Department of Education rule that says school boards are are supposed to develop long range plans and identify measurable and attainable short term objectives. Um, why is strategic planning so important? Well, well, it lets you plan um, and you know, it lets you look at your enrollment numbers. So it lets you look at your facilities. Um, when are we gonna have to replace the windows? When are we gonna have to replace, uh, replace computers? Do we have um, the facilities and the technology needed for a 21st century learning environment? How much is this going to cost? What do we have to bond? What can we fit within our regular, our, our, or no, or no, our, our normal operating budget? Um, strategic planning can go in a hundred different directions. Every board does strategic planning a little bit differently. Some of them do it within the board and maybe the administrative team. Other districts I've seen um, have opened it up community-wide. Um, and they said, look, we're, we're engaging in a, a year-long process you want to hear your voice, um, you know, if you want to contribute, we'll find a subcommittee for you to be on. Um, and kids, kids got to be, kids should be involved in this to give us students. Yeah, we, we, work, we, we, we work with a consultant that we've got to keep in touch with, if you're um, depending on the scope of it. It's an additional fee for fee service. I'll be upfront about that. Um, but yes, NHSBA works um, uh, with a um, salt. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, Mark has done probably eight or ten for NHSBA over the last number of years. Usually does about two a year. Um, that obviously the last two years obviously got. Um, but yeah, we can, we can. I can put you in touch with. Let you guys have a conversation with. with Yeah, um, yeah. Um, the board can establish a timeline. Um, Mark, uh, the consultant um, that we work with, I think he likes to do it within about a four or six month time frame. So it's fresh. So by the time it's done, it's still it's still fresh. Um, and the the thing I like about Mark, um, he doesn't live in Stratford anymore, but he was a he was on the school board in Stratford, New Hampshire, maybe 15, 20 years. Gets it. That was what it's like to. Board member, we know about the various constituencies. Absolutely. Questions? No, I apologize for eating up all, all of your time. Um, I'm going to jump over to page seven real quick. I can rip through the, the superintendent stuff in about five or ten minutes or so. Um, I'm on page seven. Um, so and there's going to be some comparing and contrasting here. Um, boy, I have. You know, you may have a different version of the one I have. The one I pulled out is from April 2020. Oh, okay. We have an updated version of that. I apologize for not. But it's the same material, just sort of. 
Um, so superintendent's role, um, I'm, on, I'm on page seven, um, implement school board policy. Talked a little bit earlier about the school board's primary responsibility is adopting policy um, and, and your policy requirements um, uh, uh, under various laws. Superintendent's job is to implement policy. And there are, just as there are um, Department of Education rules that speak to school board's roles and responsibilities and duties, there are corresponding um, uh, uh, Department of Education rules that speak to the superintendent's responsibilities as well, too. And I want to highlight some of these because I think it's important. Before you read anything on page seven, jump back to page two for a minute. And keep a thumb on, on page seven. We, we talked about the school board policy responsibilities under the Department of Education rules, and it said adopt policies necessary and desirable to control and effectuate the recruitment, employment, evaluation, and dismissal. School board has to have employment related policies. Take a look at, I'm back on page seven. First two bullet points. Superintendent shall nominate all certified staff and appoint other employees in accordance with state law, rules of the state board, and here's the kicker language, and local school board policies. And the next one says that superintendent shall direct and supervise the work of all employees, so on and so forth. It's, they're related and it's not by accident. School board adopts employment related policies, and then the superintendent implements those employment related policies. Back, you don't have to flip back, but back on page two, remember we talked about that language policies about the purchase of equipment, supplies, and services, your budget related policies. Now, back on page seven, and then the third bullet point now, the superintendent shall be responsible for developing and recommending to the school board. Um, uh, an annual budget for the support of the educational program, dot, 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 in accordance with local school board policy. Again, that's not by accident. And there are other examples as, as well, too, um, but I, in the interest of time, I won't go through all of them. I think that's the clearest indication that the board adopts the policy, superintendent implements those policies. And again, what's the board's oversight to make sure that the policies are being implemented appropriately? Your evaluation of the suit. Um, and then uh, to page eight and uh, page eight and nine, I'll, I'll hit these really quickly. Um, nominate professional staff. Are, are you are you familiar with how the, the nomination process works for hiring staff? And the superintendent has to make a recommendation that we hire. You know, Johnny is the math teacher. We hire Sally as the English teacher. And then the board acts on or accepts or votes on that recommendation. Without the recommendation coming forward from the superintendent, the board cannot hire that person. It can't happen. You have to have that law states, superintendent has to recommend, and this is for certified staff. Non-certified staff, your paraprofessionals, custodians, food service workers, every board does a little bit different. Um, you know, in Manchester, the superintendent, you know, the, Superintendent and the school board are not getting involved in hiring a 10 hour per week custodian, right? Um, you know, or, you know, they probably get something in their packet. John Jones was hired as a custodian for you know, uh, Main Street Elementary. Um, and then, and then the, the non renewal process, we talked a little bit about that earlier. If the teacher is non renewed, hearing before the board. But what I also want to talk about is page eight and nine. Um, these are, um, so, RSA 194C4 provides superintendent services. Um, and these are all the things that the superintendent is responsible for, at least on paper. We know that there are more in the, the actual job. Um, but again, this, this is the state statute that sort of lists out all the responsibilities of a superintendent. And if you look through these, you realize that these are more of sort of the day to day operations of the school district, right? Payroll, cash flow, bills. Um, review of a cur curriculum, D, compliance with federal law, um, writing uh, federal grants. Um, there's one in here about policy that I wanted to um, highlight. I think it says make policy, rec maybe that's in the rules, make policy recommendations for the board. Yeah, there we go, I'm sorry, I'm, ba I'm back on page seven, I skipped right over it. 
The last bullet point, 302.02R, the superintendent is responsible for the implementation and review. Um, but anyway, um, excuse me. So these are the day-to-day -day responsibilities of, of the superintendent. And while maybe not directly on point, I'm guessing, I'm guessing you have a lot of policies that touch on these sorts of things. The federal grant policy, for example. Superintendent's responsibility, or the school board has to sign that and send in the minutes. I have no idea. I do know why. Um, when the reality is the superintendent is the one that's managing the grants and making sure that you're in compliance with them. Um, pupil transportation, annual budget, school calendar, you know, but there's interplay, right, between the board and the and the administration on all of these things. But mostly you're gonna have policies that again, maybe not directly on point, but you're gonna have policies that that touch and relate on all of these sorts of things. Um, so and uh, last on page 10. Um, this is a, a little chart, if you will, that I, um, I annexed from my good friends at the Idaho School Boards Association. That just, it, it puts it, you know, I think it's a good visual, you know, the role and responsibility, um, who, you know, what the school board does with that, what the school You know, a good thing to just, in, in closing, um, a school board member, this was many years ago, um, Gentleman on the school board, been on the board for probably 15 years. He said, when I have a question before, constituent, I ask myself three things to find out. Does it relate to policy? Does it relate to budget? How does it work out? I mean, that's a pretty, a pretty good way to distill it. Um, and obviously, there are other duties, you know, that, you know, other, you know, poop. That's my spiel. Uh, appreciate you for indulging. Eat up too much of your evening. Uh, are there any questions? There is. Yeah, we we've we've done we haven't done this webinar in a couple of weeks. for a few years. Um we did a, a have that but I would ask Bill Patty if you could please send me where's asked. Yeah, but yeah, but I think I did a jitter. Add some materials, and we have a policy too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let me let me those up, and also I would say you're you're April, right? To go on our website. Um, um, go to our home page. There's a drop down tab called Documents. That drops down and say. You've got pages and pages. Anytime we do a webinar, or gotta check with the manager. She may not have gotten up or something. But we've got probably two or three. Check there, I'll get these. Some of these might be. I mean, yeah, you, you can't, you know, you can't, what's, what's your goal? Well, I have the best high school in the state. Damn. <laughs> you know, but, I mean, right. Yeah, they have to, they have to be measurable. All right, we, we want to increase our, increase our math scores by 2% over the next year. Yeah, I, I don't, I, I don't do the strategic planning like a,
when I first started working here, there was like a huge community wide um, strategic planning session that we flew someone in. It was a pretty big deal. And I think the issue with those things is you, you put all this work in and you get this big thick binder that goes on a shelf. I think the new, you know, the new way is like a plan on a page. That, you know, is, that is a classic story. Yeah. Went through this, we hired a consultant, 10 grand, we got this, you know, <laughs> 300 page document. Yeah. And when we were done, it went on a shelf and nobody picked yeah. it up since. So. The other thing, too, um, relative to strategic planning that I, 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 I glossed over, um, when boards engage NHS engage strategic I tell them, spend good money on this, spend a lot of time and effort on this. Every single school board meeting, every single school board meeting moving forward, I want an agenda item that talks about the May not be an action. It may be a five-minute agenda item. It may just be a check-in. Hey, facilities director, where are we? Hey, Patty, where are we with that? Oh, did we? Did we? Uh, you know, did do whatever. That way, it's, it's consistent. It's real. It's breathing. You get six months in, and you have to pivot because you know. Oh, it's all right. We thought this was going to be great, but we're in it six months or a year. You know what? We need to change because it's not quite working out. Like you put an agenda item relative to the strategic plan, um, you put a strategic plan on the agenda as a constant reminder that it's there. <laughs> Can I ask a question on behalf of Amy? So Amy's not here, but her question was, what are the top, I think, five mistakes that boards make? So be careful, you know, not to do X, Y, and Z. Yeah, that was a hard question. Yeah. We're live, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, spending too much time on social media, responding to social media. Get off it and stay off it, folks. I'm telling you, nothing good comes from it. It's a, it's a screaming match. You, you, uh, you never change anybody's mind. Half, if not more, of what's posted is inaccurate. Um, not saying you can't use social media effectively. Push stuff out. Um, getting involved in the minutia, day to day operations are not the school board's responsibility. Um, one um, somewhat related to that, and this one is certainly done with the best of intentions, is trying to solve everybody's problem or everybody's complaint or everybody's concern. can't happen. Um, you get the call from a constituent um, about an issue in the, in the second grade and their daughter and this, that, and the other thing. You don't have any authority to, to call that second grade teacher and find out what happened in the second grade classroom. That's the principle. Even if you even if you did call and find out, what do you what are you as an individual going to do? Hey, the law doesn't allow you to do anything. Listen to the people you recept you receptive of their concern or issue. Come familiar with policy K E B. That's a chain of communication policy. Back to the teacher, referring back to the building up. This is a, a little aside. Um, this is again how you exercise your oversight of the superintendent. You get that call or that email from that constituent. You let Patty know. Mrs. Smith called me. Something happened in the second grade classroom. Trust will take care of it. If it doesn't get taken care of. What's going to happen? You're going to hear from that same parent again in a week. You told me that the principal or superintendent was going to call me. I haven't called from anybody. And then you call Patty and you say, "What's going on?" But Mrs. Smith called me again as I read. You told me it was going to get taken care of. Or the other thing that happens is you get 10 complaints from the same classroom within like two days of one another. At that point, you know something really wrong in that classroom. Right? So top five, what did I say? Social media, um, Yusha, and again, yeah, yeah. Um, What gets school boards in trouble? Mask mandates. Um, 
Oh, sorry. I'm trying to add a little vibration. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I don't, those are the those are the first three that really fit. Yeah. 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 Right. Right. I mean, there's nothing wrong with questions. There's nothing wrong with discussion. If you're not clear on something, there's nothing wrong with asking the superintendent or who's ever presenting the BA or whoever for more clarification. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, it's a tough question to answer because it's it's kind of individual. It's it, it's it's how personality trait to some degree, right? Um, you know, there's is is nothing wrong with. And when you say getting into the minutia. I mean, is it is it about are you getting into the minutia at a school board meeting where you're discussing certain things? And okay, so effective meetings then. Okay. Oh, okay. So yeah. Oh, absolutely. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Do, were you able to listen to our our webinar the other day on um uh, uh, effective meetings and, and roles of the board chair? What? Yeah. Yeah. You, we. Okay. Yeah. We we did that. It was probably three weeks ago at this point. Again, if you could send me a reminder email, we can send you a recording of the webinar. Part of that is uh, is parliamentary procedure um, to some degree. Um, <clears throat> A couple of basic rules: um, no person speaks twice until everybody said until everybody else has had a chance to speak on a, on a particular agenda item. So I've seen too many meetings where, you know, John will speak, and then is it Gene will speak, then John speaks again, and then Wendy speaks, and then John speaks again, and then April speaks, and then John speaks again. Right? Everybody speaks once until er, nobody speaks twice until everybody's had a chance to speak. At some point, too, if you've been on an agenda item for what seems like too long of a time, somebody call the question. It's all it takes, call the question. And part of that is, and I understand what you're saying about a learning curve, um, you know, just being on the board and being a brand new chair. At some point, the chair has to sort of move the meeting along. That, that's your responsibility. Um, you know, at some point, you just say, you know, you have to sense if the, if the, if the conversation is getting repetitive, um, there's a saying that Will found and put in our our our, our PowerPoint for the webinar. A, a senator from somewhere at one point said, um, "What's it saying? Everything that needs to be said has been said, but not everybody has said it." <laughs> right, <laughs> right. So, um, yeah, we have we have some some tips on parliamentary procedure. The other thing too that that can help when you're developing the agenda, and you don't have to put this on the agenda per se, but maybe in your personal notes or your copy, talk with Patty. Talk maybe talk with whoever with your agenda setting. All right, this should be a ten minute item. This might be a forty five minute item. This should be a five minute item, and just keep an eye on your on your phone and, and the clock. And when you get to all right, we thought this was going to be a ten minute item. We're still talking about it a half hour later. You got to move people along. Either move the question, or, or just say, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm closing. If it's not an action item, 
just say I'm closing discussion on this right now. I think everything that has been said. You, but yeah, we can get you that webinar as well too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I know, I, I don't know what specific districts offhand, but I've heard of some districts that will have, I think in policy, that will say, let's say they start out, you said, we, what do we start, 6.30? All right, you know, um, Pembroke School Board meetings will conclude by 9 p.m. and can only um, continue on in 15 minute increments via vote of the board. So you need a motion and a majority of the board to vote to continue the board, the, the needed for, and you can do 15 minute increments, 20 minute increments, whatever, whatever you want to do. I've seen, I've seen some boards. do. As far as I know, I mean, at the very least, it tells everybody they want to get out of here. And we got, you know, we got to get our business done. My, my question is that there were a couple that went really long and a motion was made to adjourn and it was just done. And we had, we had people to hire, we had things yeah, in yeah, non-public, which happens too. at the end. And then the things that have to happen don't yeah. happen because other things don't are don't make any important decisions at the end of a meeting. So do you suggest non-public during the meeting or before the meeting? That's that's tough. Um, yeah, I, I mean, all usually our I, hiring, we save it to the end so that yeah. people don't have to sit and wait. Right. But then yeah. that's where you're trying to hire people. And right. I mean, what? I, I don't, I mean, we, you know, we don't, we haven't surveyed our members or anything, but I sense that there's more and more boards doing non-public at the beginning of the meeting. <clears throat> and just to be clear, as I'm, I mean, your agenda has it, you can't do non-public and then open up your public meeting. The non-public session is a session, a portion of a public meeting. So you call the public meeting to order. And then you make your motion to go and you know just do the roll call or whatever that kind of if you want to do the minutes and that kind of stuff first um the problem with that can be as you said you, you don't know how long that may that may happen you know you, you may think that you're going to be in non-public session for 15 minutes for a half hour and you, if you got a room full of people or online you don't want to leave them waiting for an hour hour and a half so um and then i mean part of it would depend on what the what the non-public session is, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Seven o'clock. The portion, this public portion of the meeting will begin at seven o'clock. And if we're done, Exactly. Exactly. Right. Get a cup of coffee. Run to the restroom. Whatever you got. We had it. Yeah. Yeah. It was just a learning curve. And you had a pandemic. And you had, you had a, a pandemic. Right. I believe it. Yeah. I, I, it, this is just, I mean, one of one aspect too. I mean, what the challenges that school boards have had to go through the past again, whatever, 15, 16 months now. You know, I was talking with some superintendents, even over the summer and I think into early fall, who had people elected last March, March in 2020, and they had the superintendent and that school board member had never even met in person. And they were trying to conduct business via Zoom and phone calls and emails. And I mean, because the first thing I always tell the new school board member and the superintendent, the day after Friday after the election, you know, go grab a cup of coffee or just go to the superintendent's office and have a cup of coffee and get to know one another. If you don't already know them, you know, if, you, if it's a parent that you've known, then that's one thing. But, you know, we were dealing with school board members and superintendents who'd never met one another trying to run a school district. <laughs> Right, right, exactly, exactly.
Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, there's yes and no. Um, so here's what I've I've told some some newer school board members about about the um, about the manifest. So the, the law, the, the statute that I have listed in there, interesting. There's nothing in law that talks about signing a manifest or having a manifest. So um, RSA, this is on page three. Under the, the budget stuff, we've got a bullet point there, RSA 197-23A. That says that the treasurer can only release money on the authorization of two or more members of the school board. So that's where the two board members signing the manifest comes into play. The problem with that language is it was probably written in like 1940 when they were literally handwriting checks to pay I don't know the milkman or something. I don't know if we're taught that. Um, you know, it's all done electronic. The other aspect too, relative to um, to the manifest. I mean, well, it's certainly important to review it and keep an eye on it. If there are problems with it. Your auditor is going to pick up. Um, and you know, the money has already been raised and appropriated. You're to some degree authorized to expend it. Um, and and you know. The other thing too with the new school board member, I'm not picking on, on, on newbies, but I've gotten this question from a handful of new school board um, What I tell them, you know, if, if the manifest process is holding up the efficiency of the meeting, maybe make a note of it, of the, of the, the check number or whatever it is. Um, maybe keep a, a running list of those for your first two months on the then maybe call your superintendent and BA. Say, can I come in for a cup of coffee? Can you do it? I'm not quite sure exactly what I'm looking at. And if they can't explain it, talk about superintendent evaluation. But I trust that they're that they're going to be able to. So we had it, it, it's 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 fun that you brought that up because Will and I are staff attorney. We were doing a training a couple months ago, a different district. And um, this board member raised this very similar question. Same thing. He's only been on the board, I think, he's been on the board about a year ago, March 20, got elected. Um, and he said, he asked that, he said, I don't want to get into micromanaging, but I have questions about these, but I don't want to hold up the meeting. So he said, and he said, I get I'm new. He said, I get I'm the new guy. I don't want to be the new guy that's the, you know, in the rear end at the meeting up when I've got people that have been on the board for five, ten years sitting here. So make a running list and over over the course of a few months, a few meetings. Then and, you know, I said at the end of the school year, see if this was like a month ago, I said, I said, let's get through the school year first. <laughs> let's just get through the school year first. I said, have call your superintendent, make an appointment, have a cup of coffee with the superintendent of business manager. Yeah, I've 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 seen it done both ways. I don't know what the split is. Um, you know, I I know some school boards via policy, like the chair and the vice chair stop by the central office on Friday after work. Um, and I've seen other um, I've seen other boards that they 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 go it's in their board packet and so they they call. I've also seen the situation where the guy questions every box of paper clips and box of chalk. I, I, I was at a school board meeting a while ago, um, came down to do a training, um, and they wanted to, they had a couple of business items they wanted to get through first, and then move on. And I sat there for an hour, hour and 15 minutes, listening to this guy. 
question or pause this, let me do my presentation, and then you guys can get, can get back to this. So every board does it a little bit differently. Um, trying to think, I think the most, I mean, I'm, I'm speculating here that most boards, they do the signature piece informally in the business office. Again, on, on a schedule that's amenable to the BA and the superintendent and the board members that are authorized. So we have electronic. And you do, right, and then you do so electronic. every board member gets to see it. Right. Two people approved yep. with the electronic yep. design. Like the ones that you've got some questions about. To make the meeting look more efficient, don't don't spend the meeting talking about it. Sure, sure. Yeah. The public record, I mean, if it's in the board packet, some boards might do that. <clears throat> um, yeah, I mean, you know, certainly, I mean, anything with money is always going to be highest level. Um, you know, and if you get if you had questions from your community about it, then find a way to. Yeah. Yeah. It's a short document. It's sure. like ten pages and I'm sorry, and less less content than what's in the This is what we do, and I'll, I'll tell you, I, I don't do as much training now as I did when I was prior to becoming executive director. My favorite part of the job is coming. With that, um, thank you again for inviting me. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to come up. Thank you for your membership and any just paying dues to us. Had a to do this then. <laughs> Whenever you get to it, but I'll, I'll I'll get right back. Thank you all. If there's any follow up, by all means, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and so we will move on. Agenda item number. 2C is our first public comment section. Um, try to keep 15 minutes. It looks like we do have some company tonight. I'm not sure if that one's on. If not, there's a switch on the back. Just slide it up. It's it's not for us. It's for the recording. Check. <laughs> um, to support the dress code policy change for three rivers, um, I recently reached out to the board and was uh, deferred to Mr. Marston, who was wonderful. So thank you, Mr. Marston, um, and working to try to come up with a solution that left um, mostly the female students, because that's who it impacted, able to wear comfortable, cool clothing on these hot days that didn't get them in trouble and embarrassed um really that's all i came for i liked hearing the rest too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. um would you would you april and jean would you mind if i made a comment on that quickly okay just i just wanted to thank miss burgess um your communication to me and the board and everybody else involved was factual appropriate succinct and it was it was 
nice to hear from somebody um, that came prepared with what they wanted. And when they were presented with the procedure to get that done, followed that procedure and had a good result. So I, I just thank you for being respectful and following the procedure and doing things the right way. It's awesome. It usually is. <laughs> Okay, um, nobody else is present, so we'll go ahead and close public comment um, and we'll move on to 2D, which is the Three Rivers Handbook. So I will turn it over to Mr. Marston. Before he starts, while he's getting his mic, I'll just mention that the other handbooks are not on here yet because our um, discipline laws are changing on July 1st. So we have some summer work planned and we need to revise those as a team. Uh, so we're going to be presenting the other handbooks at the beginning of August. But um, Mr. Marston had some things ready that we thought were important for you to have. And so if I uh, we come back over the summer with some of those, I'll add them to Three Rivers also. Um, I don't know if you folks have had an opportunity to uh, kind of look through the list of things here. Um, most of it's a relatively uh, just cleaning it up, so to speak. Um, I don't know. How do you want me to do this? Do you want me to read it or just kind of go explain it? Or if you think you can just hit the high notes, yeah, because yeah, you know, otherwise we'd we'll be here for a while. Um, you know, the first thing is the attendance uh, is just getting rid of it in a marking term. Um, and then we also we used to have um, truancy was 15% approximately. Now we're just we're you know we're lining it up with, with law. It's five full days um, of unexcused absences will be, or is considered truant. That's the state uh, law. Um, if unexcused absences continue. Then we a second phone call will be made and the police department will be notified. Uh, behavioral expectations. This really is relatively simple. We used to have something called a problem solving report. We changed it a couple of years to a core value report. <clears throat> we really felt, and you can see down, uh, just changing the terminology, really tried to get to um, a place where it's uh, instead of I kicked a kid because it was, uh, you know, I wasn't responsible for my own actions. So we're trying to get to our core values of uh, responsibility, respect, grit, and integrity, and putting that throughout the school culture versus. Um, um, you know the kind of the old way we did it um, and uh, students also respond to this by um, having the opportunity to uh, respond by the way to handle the situation was so we changed it really from a PSR to a CVR so it was a problem solving report now it's a core value report so anywhere in our document you'll see that change uh, we added uh, you know our wonderful list uh, Electronic uh, cigarette and vapes as part of uh, uh, out of school suspension, which we have seen an increase with, uh, but it's also something that's not new, but it needs to be replaced here. Um, and then adding language to us, uh, our social probation, which is really the use of electronic device uh, to capture any images, footage, or audio recording without permission. Uh, you know, a few years ago, uh, one of my staff members had said, if somebody walked into a bathroom with a camcorder on their shoulder, uh, everybody would freak out. Uh, well, that's done every day now with their, with their, with their uh, phones. And, and so we have had incidents where this has happened this year uh, since we've been back. And we really need to have strong language in there to uh, you know, support um, kids in, the, in those environments. And then there's the dress code. Um, we did uh, spend a little time uh, looking at this. And um, honestly, like all Paula's, I think it's important to update and to keep as uh, current as we possibly can. Um, I think some of the biggest changes, we tried to get rid of all the lists that we possibly could, so we didn't have a continual list. Uh, we tried to get rid of all the measurements. Um, which is frankly, it's unattainable to walk around saying, well, if you've got three fingers, you got two fingers, whatever it is. Uh, we really felt um, covering the entire torso would be uh, a, a little bit uh, easier to understand and to uh, enforce. Um, kept some of the other language about any uh, clothing and accessories that reference sex, drugs, and alcohol. Basically, anything that's 
that's uh, disruptive to school procedure. You know, if, if I have to walk by and I do a double take, uh, then we're probably, you know, we <laughs> have to have a conversation. We also added um, language that was brought to our attention about um, how we address kids, and we've always really tried to address kids as appropriately as possible, but really wasn't in the handbook. So uh, students wearing an inappropriate color will be addressed quietly and privately by staff unless there's a safety issue that requires immediate attention. Um, we've always tried to do that, um, and we certainly, uh, I think it was important enough, however, to add, and that came from the community, Ms. Burgess. I think that was an important piece to add so that we have that uh, going forward. Um, we also added some, under the sexual harassment and harassment policy, uh, just added some stuff that a, re a report may be made at any time to the TRS Title IX coordinator, which is the school principal, um, full school board policy, uh, outlining Title IX process can be found, and there's an attachment. Um, and we added language for suicide prevention, liaison contact information, and also to the homeless liaison contact information, but which no, I believe that's uh, is something we have to add into our handbooks. Try to do that quick. Yeah, it's good. Any questions? Any, yeah, any questions? Is a printed hand is a printed copy of the handbook for families, or is this made available online? It's typically made online. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. They can get one if they want to print it. We can give it to them. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah. I just have um, a concern. I tuned into the New Hampshire State uh, Board of Education Board of Trustees meeting today. And one thing I don't see represented in here is talking about, we want to make sure a uh, cause for disruption of the classroom or school order. Um, what concerns me is, based on the meeting that I listened into, is the concern that some students' um, freedom of speech right may be uh, violated. The example that was spoken about in today's meeting was that in a middle school, I don't if they didn't name which one, they had a Cape Day. And um, in that school, there were children who came with, um, you know, rainbow capes. There were some that came with BLM capes. Um, the only, there was a student, though, that was asked to change or address because that student wore a, a, a blue line cape. So there was some conversation coming forward that there need to be more conversations to make sure that students' First Amendment rights are not violated. And I'm a little concerned with the ambiguity of this language because it's not clearly, there, there's no guideline to state that a student, that won't happen to a student in our schools. Thank you. I'm open also to any um, suggestions on language that may address that. And that's my biggest concern about the dress code uh, policy. I love seeing that it's not listed boy girl like when I was a kid so um, I think it's I, I definitely like the amendments so thank you other questions okay um, do we, we need action on this right you can approve the later okay um, so is there a motion to approve the amendments as presented Um, is there a second? I'll second. Any other discussion? There are, for discussion, is there a hard deadline on when this must be in since it's printed electronically? Or made available electronically, is there a deadline that it must be made available? To the public? Or to Correct. the students? Right, right. Um, is there a deadline? I don't think there's a deadline. No. Okay. Yeah. All right, thank you. I know in the past with some handbooks, we've heard we need to take action by a certain date. So that's what I'm asking. Thank you. Um, from, I think, I think the 95 degree days are behind us for a minute. Well, um, we hope so. But yeah, <laughs> but from my perspective, I guess the, the reason I would like to take action tonight is there is a week and a half of school left. It could be hot. And if there are, you know, but my own daughter was worried about what she wore to school yesterday, I think, because she thought maybe her shorts weren't quite as long as they were supposed to be by the letter of the law. Um, but it was 92 degrees, and it would be nice for children to not have to worry about those things quite so much for the next week and a half. 
Oh, gotcha. Yeah, you're right. I, I, I will, I, I feel like I do need to say that I have shared this with staff at a staff meeting. Um, we've had some really good conversations about it. Um, and there was no feedback, no negative feedback. And also, before we wrote this, I had staff involved, a number of staff members involved. Um, and I, I think, um, you know, I've been in the business a while, and this comes up all the time. And so we just try to keep sharpening the pencil until we get it down to a, an area that, that's good. And I can guarantee you we could set up 10 kids and we'd have 10 different opinions on what's appropriate or not. So it's really always very, very challenging. But if we can get language that is easier to implement um, and, and more reasonable for everyone, I, I think we have a better shot at it. Uh, I don't think I have had any, any student come to my, uh, down to the office uh, in the last two weeks on a, on a violation. Anything else? I only have two of you, but you're on opposite sides. Of <laughs> okay, um, then there's a motion to approve the amendments to the CRS handbook as presented. Um, all in favor? Opposed? Abstention. As of no closure, no statement about pers preserving First Amendment rights. Thank you. No abstentions? Um, that's the end of that one. I lost my agenda. So, agenda item number two E, um, fiscal year 21 update. Numbers. I do. So, this evening you're at 1,058,262, and that is not including the excess revenue. So, there's more than that, and that is also. Um, not taking into consideration some of the POs have not been liquidated yet. Um, and just to let you know what's included in that, um, the Josh still has not entered about $30,000 in POs that you previously approved. Um, so that would come out of this and lower it a little bit. Um, and then you have a couple of items uh, to take action on this evening um, that you know may or may not change that number too. Did you say that number one more time? Sorry. Sure. 1,058,262. Um, and that's minus about 30. And then just remind me. So last at last meeting, we heard uh, we had a second list from Mr. Coughlin. And does anybody remember what the total of that roughly was? Three something? He, everything is entered except for that 30,000. So, so everything you've approved. So the two rounds that we've approved. Yes. Did we approve the second round for Josh? I don't remember. Yep. Okay. So, wow. So that's like a half million dollars that we approved for facilities and all but 30 of that is already in there. And we're still over a million dollars? That's, that's what Josh told me today when I checked in. Okay. And then, so last time, I guess we're, well, so questions on that before I think the next agenda item is very closely related to this. Um, are there any questions about that number before we talk about the other requests? I'm sorry. There was also last time you had mentioned, um, I think it was a tax rebate because of PPP or something. And you just mentioned that, but I. It, it was an IRS tax credit um, for keeping people employed during the pandemic. And that does not include that number. So that's any excess revenue you have will, will get pooled with your surplus to offset taxes. Okay. So in effect, this we're about 1.3 million right now, minus the 30K? But I would think that is a safe number right now, yes. Okay. I had mentioned uh, requesting about air conditioning mm -hmm. at TRS. Yeah, the building remodel and everything there. So was that in the drive for you? I don't see it. Okay, let me. Can I just pull up Josh's email really quickly because he did respond when I asked him about it. The email's not in the drive. I can read it to you. Just give me one second. I get a lot of emails from Josh. <laughs> if 
Okay. So I did send Josh an email um, letting him know that the board was um, interested in finding out more about window units at Three Rivers. And his response was, uh, hi, Patty, I can look into this, but it will take some time. I will need to do the following. And then there are four bullets. Bring in an electrician to survey if we have available power and then add as needed. Bring in the window company and see how we can panel off one of the windows. Price out units which work for the space. And the challenge is that the windows are sliders and some rooms like the activity room only have one set of windows. Please let me know if you'd like me to get numbers on this and I will work on this over the summer. Thank you, Josh. Any other questions about the current surplus estimate before we move on to the rest of the end of the year requests? Okay, um, then the next agenda item is end of year requests. We had some um, requests for, from administration. Um, we've got a few things in our drive. We've got looks a detailed quote about the library stuff, um, an email from Josh about the outside play area at Three Rivers. Um, and I don't, I know last time we approved. Um, Partially, so we approved some reading program things. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess if we want to start with Dr. Morris and talk about the library stuff a little bit, I don't know if you've got any, you've pretty much shared everything with us and we've got documentation now in our drive. So I don't know if there's anything else you want to let us know about. Uh, it's, it's really more of a summary. Um, just to review, uh, Julie, our tech integrator, who is in attendance here in person as well as remotely. So um, <laughs> comprehensively covered tonight. Um, and our uh, librarian, Christy Smith, worked on three different quotes. Uh, one was for 174,000. One was for uh, 156,000. Uh, and Demco, the quote that you have uh, more detail on, was for 131,000. Uh, and, you know, that quote broke things down into shelving, circulation desk, uh, basically all of the different um, components uh, for a what what I would consider to be a, a pretty uh, substantial transformation of that space. Okay, um, let's go ahead and ask Mr. Marston about the playground stuff. We'll go through them all and then we can do questions. I don't know if there's really much else to say. Well, there's one thing I could say, I guess. I can go bigger if needed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I want to say that too. <laughs> uh, when we did that, this is a five-piece fitness uh, center. Uh, it, frankly, it's really hard to find something for this age group. Um, it's not a you know they're not traditional play playgrounds that you know that age group uh, can work on. But we thought you know I've been thinking of a fitness center for a while. This is on the low end. Uh, there are fitness centers that go up to you know eighty thousand dollars. I mean, it's you know so you can get pretty crazy. But that's a note, also an installed price. The company comes out and installs it. Okay. And I don't remember what pieces were left at Hill other than was it just reading stuff? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, questions. I, I would be interested in knowing more about if this is the low end for the playground equipment, what other options are there? Because I think when we talk about um, playground equipment, it's not just an investment in our school, but it's an investment in our community since community members can use the public grounds anytime outside of school hours. So I would be interested in seeing possibly more for TRS um, as an investment in our schools and communities instead of the bare bottom of the barrel. Thank you. I would agree with that. I don't know as far as time goes. I mean, do we have the opportunity to do a, an approve up to and? I think the request at the last meeting was to see what we were proposing to buy with the 25,000. It's actually 30 now, but um, you can certainly approve an up to, um, you know, not to exceed number and Josh and Mr. Marcy can work on that. The difficulty is where we are in the, the year that those POs have to be entered immediately. So it would need to be something that 
you know, Josh and John could easily go in there and say, okay, here's the next level of the set. And this level is 60,000. We're going to get that. So okay. you could yeah, uh, just, uh, this has been a getting, uh, this information put together quickly is hard, but this company has actually been very responsive with Josh. He's had a relationship with them. And so, uh, this turnaround was actually very quick. Uh, they do have other structures, um, that would, you know, that would be more substantial. We'd have to figure out space. Right. Because all this takes space. Uh, but um, we can certainly, we can, I can do that pretty quickly. Okay. Other questions? I'm just going to make a motion right now. Um, I'd like to make a motion to approve up to $50,000 for outside exercise playground equipment for TRS. Point. I'll second that motion. All right. Any other any discussion around that? Right. Uh, motion to approve up to fifty thousand dollars expenditure for outside exercise playground equipment at Three Rivers School. All in favor? Oh, sorry. Discussion. <laughs> um, Mr. Morrison, since you did the research, I'm just wondering if we we could get an idea of what fifty thousand may get us. I know you don't have a quote on that, but since this is, you know, bottom of the barrel, what do you think twenty thousand dollars could get the district and the town? Well, you know, it all depends on what the focus becomes. You can get, um, this stuff gets really expensive very quickly. You can get like a, a big spider uh, climbing unit for $100,000, one piece. So you have to be really, uh, kind of get creative, and that's what we tried to do with this. So that was this particular unit, there's 120 different exercises. Um, you can enlarge that and get, you know, seven to uh, 10 different stations. There's other uh, stations that have different equipment, like we come at bikes, outdoor bikes, um, that, you know, kids sit in and they, you know, rowing machines are all outside. Um, so you just, you add uh, not only better, but more options uh, to the different packages. You can also do a la carte, where you start getting individual pieces of equipment um, that are, you know, between, you know, six and $10,000 a piece. Uh, but it would be individual pieces of equipment that you kind of, like I said, all apart versus a package. Um, Follow-up would just be a question about warranty. I have children of my own, and I'm hearing about moving pieces, and generally what that means is something breaks. So I'm just curious about any kind of warranty for a period of time. Do you have any information about that? I, I don't, uh, but that's something we certainly would, uh, you know, be part all part of the package when we start um, so this was just an initial quick quote so we could put something on, on paper to be honest with you um and the, the further we get into it we would certainly get the, you know the best warranty we possibly could get thank you other discussion right all in favor of um proving expenditure of up to fifty thousand dollars to three river school for outside exercise playground equipment aye opposed and abstentions great any, anything else? How's <laughs> 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 He's not here to. Um, yeah. I'd like to uh, make a. Okay, let's. Okay, we'll. I'd like to make a motion to approve up to one hundred fifty thousand dollars for replacement and transformation of the Pembroke Academy Library slash Media Center. That is okay. yes. Amy. All right, um, I'll second that. Is there discussion? Um, I. Our superintendent, I'll let her go first. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't see you. Um, I was just going to clarify, you, you're you approving what is on this list, but you're giving us a little bit of wiggle room in case something comes in more or there's an installation or... Perfect. Great. Go ahead, April. Um, I'm just curious, um, the equipment that's currently in the library, what will happen to that equipment? Will it be moved and used in other places of the district? Do you have any kind of visual schematic to show us the future of the library, what it may look like with these changes that have been 
proposed. So uh, with some of the existing shelving and furniture, I would imagine that, I mean, that's Josh Coughlin would be better prepared to answer that, but he's always tried to repurpose those throughout the district. Uh, and we would certainly try to do that uh, or assist him in doing that. Uh, and one of the things that really stood out with this company opposed to the other two competitors in their quotes is that this company provided or provides, I don't know that they've put it together yet, but they provide a 3D model uh, of what it would all look like when it is completed. Other questions or discussion? What? I believe a couple of meetings ago that we heard that this is only kind of the first step in remodeling the library. Um, I know we've been told before, but it's out of my brain at the moment. Um, what are the next steps and anticipated costs for remodeling the library? Yeah, um, again, part of that gets into Josh's world a little bit. Uh, we have in there uh, uh, two different carpets. Uh, one is yeah, I mean, I, I want to say one of those was there when I was here as a student, uh, and the other one is is newer. Um, and we would like to replace that, but I think that does involve an asbestos abatement. And so that is a, a process that is very much in Josh's world, uh, and we would have to look into that. Uh, part of that would also include the removal of some built-in bookshelves that are under the windows. And that would also expose asbestos. So that process would have to wait until that abatement was secured. The other uh, item that would be part of phase two, if you will, would be the development of what they call a storefront wall, which is basically like the vestibule when you come in, or actually this, this kind of door entryway right here, where you would have a steel door, but then you also have steel frame windows. And that would uh, allow for um, security in our maker space for the equipment that's in there, but but also continue to have visibility because there's some really neat stuff happening in that space. But that equipment's also expensive. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I apologize if it's on this quote and I missed it. Is there an ex anticipated um, delivery date? Because I do see this as an installed quoted price. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. So, okay, I didn't see a lead time noted. Yeah. I wasn't sure if that's something that I missed. I know no. right now it seems to be an extended lead time for almost anything, so. Sure, Julie, go ahead. Time, they wanted a time frame and he asked the question well what about winter break to do this before? answer was sure that would be very doable oh thank you other questions Okay, um, then we have a motion to approve uh, up to $50,000 for the, I'm sorry, $150,000 um, for the replacement um, of, uh, how did you say it? Jeannie says so eloquently. Replacement for the upper transformation. Replacement and transformation of the library and the library media center at um, Pembroke Academy. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And abstentions. Yes. Just a question. Um, once the library is updated, is there any sort of open house planned? I think it'd be great to, if we can, invite the public to come in to see what's happening and what great changes are happening. Sure. Thank and you. Definitely have board meeting there. Yes. Yeah. And thank you very much. Okay. Is there, is there anything that I forgot on that item, Patty? So, I think that's it. Thank you, Julie, for all your hard work. I know you. Been working on this thank you okay um and we were we added we're going to add a 2e right what was it or was that just no uh we added april's thing and another as informational yes um do you want to do those now the informational yeah 
for so if I remember what it was. Okay. Um, so we, I think I mentioned that we have to do um, an opening plan for 2122, and that's a requirement. Um, actually, it came started with the federal government, flowed to the New Hampshire Department of Ed, and flowed to us um, in order to access the um, final round of the CARES ESSER funds. Um, so we have drafted, um, we've kept it very simple. We've been talking about this as um, superintendent's organization and we're all um, leaving a lot of flexibility in our reopening because we are trying to reopen as normal as we can, but understanding that we're not sure what the future will bring and that um, there may need to be some flexibilities and some changes. So we um, just, I just finished up putting it together and one of the requirements is that it's posted for public input. So I will um, make sure that we get it up on the website. We'll probably send it home in, in an email, one call now. Um, and Josh is creating an email address just for this. So it might be something like Pembroke feedback at SAU 53 um, so that all of the feedback gets funneled to one place and we can keep track of it and, and look at it before the plan is finalized. Um, and we are allowed to revise the plan, so we'll make sure we get it in by June 23rd, but the Department of Ed has made it clear that under the circumstances, revisions will likely need to be made. Um, so we'll keep it fluid and um, leave some flex flexibilities in there. So we'll be sure to get you a copy of that. Great, thank you for that. First item. It doesn't need to be approved, yeah, thank you. Thanks for asking. I will want your feedback, of course. <laughs> And then um, the second informational item that some people may have seen, and I meant to print it out and I didn't, um, we received notification yesterday that there was a joint statement issued by Dr. Chan and by Commissioner Edelblue um, advising schools that masks should not be required outside um, for vaccinated or unvaccinated um, students. So that was the joint statement that was issued. We um, sent that out to administration today. Um, you have a mask policy in place, but I believe we also have approved plans that say we're going to follow the guidance um, that is sent to us. So um, we haven't had a conversation as an administrative team yet that just came out and, um, you know, there's a week left in school and we've had some um, outside activities that we have offered students some flexibilities and asking them to still stay distanced, but understanding that we're in the heat and they're outside and they're having activities, we've certainly relaxed. Um, the mask requirement when they're outside. And I think, Wendy, you have recess now without masks, correct? Yeah. So trying to follow that guidance and give some flexibilities and make sure that the students don't overheat. Excellent. Okay. Um, that brings us to agenda item number three, which is policy. And the one thing we have listed is GBDB. I like to say yes. that one. So we had lots of red line on the last version and, and Amy said it would um, be easier for you and I agree to look at just the final copy um, without all of the red line. So um, one thing that I wanted to mention with health insurance, the, um, the new paraprofessional master agreement has a three year plan for insurance and for um, to make things easier, I just put that three year plan in your policy so that you don't have to keep looking at this every year to update with the paras. So I thought it would be easier just to put the, the full three years in there. Um, and then I did not make any other changes other than those that we went over at the last meeting. So another, is it safe? Another way to say that is, so I guess clarification first, this is um, a policy regarding non-certified staff but now that we have a paraprofessionals union, this is not applied to them. So this would be any staff that's not certified that's also not a paraprofessional, correct? That is correct. So our food service workers, our custodial staff, our office support staff, um, anyone but a para that's okay. non-certified. And so is it safe to say as a summary um, that the benefits contained here mirror what is in the paraprofessionals contract? Correct. Other questions? Um, just a statement and, and kind of a question. Um, this is an optional policy, and I'm just curious, do we really need this policy because there's other contract issues that we talk about um, that we don't have policies for? And I'm concerned that we're documenting 
um, specific companies' names, even though there's a disclosure, not really listing it there, an HMO, HSA, all that good stuff, like talking in typical insurance language, um, really just questioning why we need this optional policy in writing and why we can't just give direction on the contract without a policy. Sure, I think the pot that is exactly why the policy has been in place because this is what the board approves the benefit package. Um, if you'd like to change the model that we bring you a contract and you approve the contract language, I think that would be acceptable as long as the board approves the benefit package that our uh, non-certified staff receive. That's really the important part. Any other questions, discussion, or action? Yeah, if we could, if um, we could get a motion to either approve the policy or just withdraw the policy and approve the contents, either would be acceptable. So I would like a motion that we re we. I'll take that. I would like to make a motion that we remove policy GBDB and approve the language of employees' contracts moving forward. Thank you. All right. Discussion? Okay. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And abstentions? Fantastic. Hey, we got a policy done. What so else? we withdrew, but I think we need a motion to approve the benefit package outside of the policy. You included it. Is that okay? She, Did you mean include those it, approve this language or just in general approve the contract language? Um, in, in general, I think it was to include it in the contract. Um, but my question would be, since it's contract language, do we need to talk about that non-public? Nope. We don't? Nope. Okay. Um, help me stumble through this, guys. Um, I make a motion that we approve the language in previous GBDB uh, to be included in the non-certified employee contract. I like it. I'll second it. Conversation, discussion, questions. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? And abstentions? Thank you, thank you. So that brings us to agenda item number four, even though it feels like 10. Um, this is our second public comment section. Um, if any members of the public in attendance would like to speak, go ahead and come up to the mic. Both said no, so we will move on. Um, the board has need to go into non-public session under New Hampshire RSA 91-A colon three, Roman numeral two, small letters B and C, which are the hiring of any person as a public employee or and matters which if discussed in public would likely affect adversely the reputation of any person other than a member of the board. Um, motion to go into non-public. Second. All right, on roll call vote, Jean. April? Yes. And I'm yes at 8.34 p.m. Here. See the numbers ticking by. We're good. good. All right. So I think we have some action. Hey. Yep, the recording's yep. back on. Yep. I would like to nominate last night paper, Leah Murphy as the art teacher at Pembroke Hill School. Make a motion to approve. All right. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Cool. I think there's a little bit of other business. I would like to um, request that we approve the staff request for um, their, ch their child to attend Pembroke Academy. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Great. And then um, I would like to go ahead and make a motion, as we've done in years past, to give um, the superintendent the authority to hire staff um, in from now until we reconvene August 3rd. Um, in case there are hires that have to be done, uh, we don't want to hold that up for approval. 
Great discussion. My concern is this board meets again on June 17th. So we have an opportunity to, um, if there's any action needed between now and then, I would support um, that not as of today, but after our last scheduled meeting, June 17th. Um, I wouldn't, I mean, it, it wouldn't, I wouldn't mind that too much. Um, my intention, just to be clear, for the June 17th meeting is for goal setting and only goal setting. And of course, it's a public meeting, um, but I, I don't intend there to be anything on the agenda that doesn't absolutely have to be there outside of goal setting. That's the only reason I wanted to do it tonight. <laughs> uh, other questions, comments, discussion? I think as long as the school board is meeting, we do have that, that we can meet. It, these are things that only take maybe 10, 15 minutes. If needed, we could act on that within 10 or 15 minutes. It's not going to take too much time from this board to address any hiring issues. Thank you. All right. Um, all in favor of giving Patty higher authority um, until August 3rd. All in favor? I didn't say I very loud. Sorry, Sandy. I <laughs> opposed? No. And abstentions. Right. Did I miss anything? There was a couple of things at the beginning. I, I think we got two informational items. We got the non-publics. I think we're good. Okay. Um, next scheduled meeting, as discussed, is June seventeenth, six thirty. Um, again, of course, public is is uh, welcome to attend. The intention of that meeting is for the board to set goals um, for themselves for the upcoming uh, school year. And with that, I will accept the motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, but you're not done. You got a long meeting. <laughs>